Cool. So I'm going to hand over to Ada. Thank you very much. Health and safety. There we go. I'm going to fly into the audience. Cool. So hi, I'm Ada Rose Cannon. Um, I'm from um, the Samsung Internet Browser, and I'm here to talk to you today about um, about XR in the web. Um, and I'll get into details in that. Well, that is in a sec. Uh, so before we begin, oh, move my mouse from the screen. Doo -doo -doo. So who here's heard of our browser before? Holy shit! <laughs> okay, good job. Who here uses our browser? Yeah. Okay, we're, we're really cool. We're like um, um, we're an Android browser. If you have an Android device, you can download it and use it. We're just um, released. Um, the latest beta version of our browser at the moment, which is like some really cool stuff like um, JavaScript imports and uh, web components and web Bluetooth, uh, web payments. We're like, we're really focused on like driving forward some new APIs in the web. So we're, we're heavily involved in the immersive web community group and we're um, like in web payments and Another API, which I've forgotten about, and I'll definitely remember halfway through my talk and kick myself. Um, so one last question. Who here tests on our browser? So we, a few of you, right? We have like 7% market share in the UK for mobile devices, um, which may not sound huge, but considering there are millions of people in the UK, like, it ends up being quite a large amount of users. So, like, if nothing else, please download Samsung Internet on your testing devices just to make sure that your sites work across. Because we are, although we're a Chromium fork, there may be some slight differences between us and Chromium. Cool. So, there is one more th awesome thing about our browser. It works in virtual reality as well. So, this is Samsung Internet for the Gear VR which is a full-featured web browser running in a virtual reality headset. And I like this particular example because this is running the Space Jam website. Is, who here is a fan of the Space Jam website? Yeah! It's like my favorite website ever. Um, I'm actually not joking. It is actually in my bookmarks. Like, there we go. Where's Space Jam? Space Jam, Space Jam. Space Jam. Because... Who doesn't love the Space Jam website? Anyway, so this website was developed in the mid-90s, and it was built when the very concept of this device was unimaginable. So it's running on, on a handset more powerful than any computer of the time. It's running in a, in a web browser in a device which was pure science fiction, in a virtual reality headset, which is just super cool. And here it is working just like normal. I definitely just disconnected my controller. There we go. All right, so here's what I'm talking about today. Um, XR in the web. So has anyone heard of the term XR before? A few of you. OK. Um, so. If I just disconnected this somehow, so I'm just going to refresh the page, because that always fixes all errors. Come on. Work. Oh, my controller's broken. Oh, no, there we go. Just my computer's being really slow. Cool. So yeah, XR in the web. Um, so XR is an umbrella term for VR and AR together. So, and the reason for this is that they're not, augmented reality and virtual reality are not two distinct technologies. They're two ends of the same spectrum. So virtual reality is where you put on a headset and you replace 
the entire environment around you with a virtual scene. Augmented reality is where you either use a phone or a headset, and you'll be adding virtual objects into the world around you. But there are, there's a gradient between them, so you can replace more or less parts of the scene or the environment, depending on what you're on. So if you're on a, an advanced headset, like the Microsoft HoloLens or the Magic Leap, then you could probably replace like, the floor and the walls with entirely virtual content, but still have it considered like augmented reality. And, and the middle point's often called mixed reality, or MR for short. So to cover all these terms, we've just called it XR. So, to recap, so virtual reality is where you are surrounded by the virtual environment. And AR is when you're bringing virtual stuff to you. So XR is the umbrella term for mixing reality and generated images. So why XR on the web? Um, and this is kind of an interesting thing, like, because traditionally, like, the web has been a 2D medium. Um, but I really think that XR devices, so headsets um, designed for bringing information to the world around you, are going to be the, the future of, of our hardware devices. And the web had a bit of a rough transition from desktop to mobile. As you probably all remember, the hellish time we had building web pages for mobile at first, if you would have built building web pages in, that, in those days. And so the web, so when these devices start becoming standard and used more regularly, and I'm not talking next month or, or in like one or two years, but in five or ten years, the web's going to need to have a presence there. But the web can also do a lot for XR as well. Because right now, the state of XR is one where the, um, if you want to use any kind of XR interaction, you usually involves downloading an app, which is hundreds of megabytes to several gigabytes in size. It takes a long time to download. You then have to fire it up and use it. And then once you've finished with it, even if you only use it for 30 seconds or a few minutes, you then have it laying around on your device, just taking up space. And this is the same problems which, which we're trying to solve with, with native apps and progressive web apps. And it's just a more extreme version of this situation. So if you just want to build something that's really accessible to devices and connect to users, um, but for virtual reality, the web should ideally be the platform for you. So, by having VR capability, well, XR capabilities in the web, not only are we bringing the powers of XR to the web itself, but we're bringing the powers of the web to XR, which is amazing. Has anyone here like, built any XR stuff, VR or AR or anything? Oh, a few of you. Have any of you used any like VR headsets or AR headsets? Cool, like a lot more of you. So I'm glad to see like, like you're, you're trying out some of this content. Actually, have you tried any web VR stuff yet? A few hands. Yeah, because VR works on the web today. You can, you can load up a web page on pretty much any VR headset you can get your hands on. I think aside from PlayStation VR, um, which doesn't, for reasons, doesn't have um, um, a web VR capable browser because there isn't one on the PlayStation, but for um, but for Windows or Mac computers, Chrome and Firefox should be able to, um, and on Android, and even on iOS with the Google Cardboard. You can, you can access and display content through the web with virtual reality, 
which is really cool. It's really powerful. Um, and yeah, it, the WebVR APIs work in our browser too. We've had them for a long time. This is actually a demo from last year sometime. Um, so what I've done here is that I've landed on this web page, and it just looks like a normal web page where I'm displaying some content. I press the, 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 like, the immersive button, like, or like, it looks like a little headset, which is a button I've added to the screen, which tells the browser this content is, is prepared to use the WebVR APIs to display content immersively. And when I press it, it, it displays it to me um, through the headset. And I can look around, and I'm in the scene, which is really, really nice pattern. Um, the BBC has um, made a really cool project, I think, like, late last year, um, which works in uh, WebVR, uh, which is, this is a really cool um, uh, case study of building a web VR experience designed to work across many devices, from mobile devices on through uh, Google Cardboard and the Gear VR and Daydream, and also for, for desktop headsets like the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift. The Amazon Sumerian project is, um, is a great web-based project for building VR experiences for the web. It's really powerful, and um, Amazon actually joined the W3C um, to work on, to help work on the web VR APIs, which is super cool and amazing, and it's great to see big companies like that involved. So here's how, here's how the web VR APIs work. I'm not going to give you code samples, because the API is still changing. It's still being cooked. Um, and also, you'll probably never use it. Uh, I'll explain why in a sec. So here's just a rough idea, so you know what's happening when you do build something which involves it. So your headset will have some capability of working out its position and rotation in your environment. This allows you to, when you look around in real life, to map the virtual content to your head position. You render the scene, the virtual scene around the user from this head position. You can work out the position of any controllers they're having, such as, OK, this is a Wiimote, not a VR controller, but any controllers they're having. And you can draw it in the scene where the controller would be. So they can look down and see the controller, and it lines up so they can still push the buttons. You can then render that scene with WebGL and send it to the headset and be like, look, I've, I've rendered it to the position you've told me. Please render this. The WebGL APIs will then do some smart stuff to make sure that it gets distorted correctly for the lenses in the headset and that it gets tracked um, uh, as they move their head, even if you're not hitting the frame rates correctly, just to uh, give the user a nicer experience. So this is the kind of effect you end up with. So they can use their controllers and look around and interact with the virtual world. Because after all, this interactivity is, is, what, um, is what we're going to be after, not just displaying static content. So as, as you saw in my loop, you have to use WebGL to display content to the browser. So has anyone here built anything with WebGL before? A few hands. Um, so WebGL can be a little tricky. Um, like, it takes a lot of work to get something even quite simple. Um, so here's a short code example of how to render a cube. Um, so yeah, you start off by getting the canvas and saying it's WebGL. And then you just type out some stuff. Um, and boom, you have a cube. <laughs> was, that, was that too fast? Uh, um, yeah, WebGL is really tricky. Um, I can't do WebGL. Like, I'm, 
I'm historically a graphics developer, and even I don't write WebGL. I use one of the amazing abstractions. Um, so there's, um, uh, I've listed a few up here. So there's Play Canvas, which is a really nice WebGL library. Um, and there's React, uh, there. and there's Babylon.js, which is um, being developed by Microsoft and is also really good. Um, my personal favorite is 3.js. It's kind of the oldest one. It's been around for a very long time, but it's still very actively worked on, and it's, it's really good. And then there's A-Frame, um, which is a... A-Frame is a web component wrapper for 3.js. So uh, have you heard of web components before? A few hands. Right, web components allow you to write um, JavaScript, which defines your own custom HTML elements. So by being a web component wrapper for 3.js, it means you write HTML, and you get VR-capable 3D scenes, which is just amazing. Um, so that demo I had at like, my second slide, where I had the Samsung Internet logo rotating, that was like seven lines of HTML with, it, with the A-Frame library. So if, you, if you're a web developer and comfortable with HTML, but WebGL looks a bit gnarly, like um, A-Frame is my go-to. If you're like a frameworky, reacty kind of person, I'm not super, but I know there are a few out there. Um, React VR is a um, is a React wrapper for 3JS. It was written by Facebook and is another great way to get started for if you're more comfortable with React than HTML and web stuff. But WebGL has its downsides. So there's no DOM access. You can technically render DOM in WebGL, but the way you do it is that you import your entire style sheets and everything else into an SVG. You then render all of your HTML inside a foreign element in the SVG, render that to a canvas, and take the bitmap data from that canvas and send it to WebGL. <laughs> As you can imagine, that's not very performant. And it has the problem that because it's a bitmap, as you walk closer to the HTML element you've just rendered, it gets all pixelated. And if you walk really far back, it gets, usually the MIPS aren't so great because you haven't rendered it to a perfect 512 by 512 or whatever. Um, you can do text in virtual reality or, or in WebGL, and there's some um, really cool, I think they're called signed depth maps or something. There's a 3JS library for it. Um, and you can, you can do text, but then you end up with this thing where half of your memory is taken up with all the bitmaps for your text, just when you include like um, a couple of font families, which isn't ideal. So when we're designing our scenes for the web, we are having to think about how can I send my message using 3D models, sounds, lighting, um, um, images. So it's a different way of thinking about making websites, um, which we're probably not used to, but is a really great thing to, to try out and solve problems in a different way than we're used to with the DOM and CSS. And probably the biggest downside of WebGL is that there's no built-in accessibility. So because there's no DOM, there's no accessibility tree. So if, if, a, if someone who needs um, visual assistance with the page tries to look around, all they're going to see is there's, there's a canvas here. No other information. So if you want to start building WebGL scenes which are accessible, you have to manually write in the audio descriptions yourself and code some way for, um, for people to interact with your sites. Um, 
And it's, it's a bit trickier, but it is important we think about accessibility when building VR sites. After all, the web is for everyone. It's not just for um, um, those with great sight. Um, but yeah, aside from that, WebGL is great. <laughs> um, so I've been talking about virtual reality on the web so far, but WebVR is changing because these APIs were first developed for this device, which was the Oculus Development Kit 2, which is a cool device. Um, it was amazing, and it changed the world when it came out. It kick-started an entire industry. But things have moved on a bit since then. So augmented reality applications have been really popular. Has anyone here played Pokemon Go? Honestly? <laughs> yeah. like. It was. It took the world by storm, and and is like an ideal application for the web because it's like it's simple augmented reality. Um, there's also new um, XR cable headsets. So there's Microsoft Hololens and their mixed reality platform, and there's and the Magic Leap, both of which. Um, allow you to, they're both transparent headsets, so you can still see the world around you, and there'll be virtual content overlaid on the environment. And it's incredibly powerful and really cool. You can place a virtual object on a table and walk away and come back, and the virtual object will still be where you left it, which is incredible. And this is the, these are the headsets we need to build for, um, um, for the web for the future. What's on this slide? Oh, yeah. So, um, so this is what WebVR was designed to cover, specifically virtual reality headsets. But this is the state of the immersive world as it exists today. So aside from our virtual reality headsets, We've also got the, the augmented reality headsets, which are really powerful. They're also really expensive. So, like, has anyone here used a HoloLens or a Magic Leap? Yeah, so a few of you. I'd love to own one personally, but they're like, it's way out of my budget. Um, so, often people are doing um, augmented reality through handsets, um, much like Pokemon Go or any other AR application. And one thing we found when people were building the web VR APIs is that they weren't insisting users use a headset because you want to build something that falls back reliably for when people don't have a headset on them or when they're in public and don't feel comfortable using a VR headset. So as well as being able to use it on a desktop with a keyboard and mouse, People were building experiences where you look at it through the mobile phone like this and you can look around. And this is known as like the, the magic window experience. And it became such a standard that it's something we want to, to be built into the, the foundations of WebXR because um, it really enables like progressive enhancement for, for the web. So you could build one WebGL experience and and with only minor changes, have it work on desktops, on mobile phone through Magic Window, and VR headsets. But as well as that, you can also build in functionality so that they can use AR to place pieces of the scene around, in the environment around them. So you can place something on the floor or on the walls and interact with it that way. So, these APIs are imaginatively called the um, WebXR device APIs. And this is an example of the AR functionality. So you can do this today in Chrome Canary um, with the prototypes of the APIs. So here they've, 
they've been, looked at an article which has a WebGL rendered astronaut in it, and they press a button and it lets them use WebXR to place the astronaut in, into the environment around them, and they can see it to scale and look around it. We're also looking at replacing, at changing how the controllers work. So previously, the way that you'd get the position and the rotation of gamepad API, uh, of, of the, the controllers in people's hands, was that we added extensions to the gamepad API, which as well as telling you what buttons were pressed and the location of any joysticks, it would also um, have the position and rotation of the controller, which is really great in terms of you can build for in-depth on any particular piece of hardware. But what it means is that in three or four years down the line, you're, when no one's using that hardware anymore, your scene would stop working. So we've tried to extract the, the, the information from the controller into an XR input API, um, which gives you the position and the rotation and gives you events for pushing one button on the controller. So it's a, it's a much higher level um, overview, uh, much higher level API. But the nice thing about it is because it's part of the platform, it actually counts as user activation events. So you can use it to start videos playing and, and request permissions, which you couldn't do with the gamepad previously. Um, and, it, and because it's um, a generic interface, if you built a XR-based experience, um, using the XR input API, it would work on, on a three degrees of freedom controller, like a Daydream or a Gear VR. It would work on a six degrees of freedom controller, e even ones which haven't been built yet. And it would even be possible for browsers doing hand detection to, to allow you to draw a hand in the scene because it knows where the hand is. And it could probably even interact to, to like, if you wanted to click on something using finger guns, you could do something like that. Um, see, that's why I use a strap. Um, and the nice thing about this is that you can build a website which, which will last into the future. Because like the Space Jam website, we want to build experiences which work again and again and again and are not tied to specific pieces of hardware. Um, oh yeah, and you can use this today. Um, so, like, as I said, the API is still changing, um, but you can use it in Chrome Canary by turning on, on a few flags, and you can use the XR polyfill to polyfill it on, on devices which don't yet have the XR device API enabled. Um, if the web VR APIs are available, it will even use them in the polyfill to make it more performant. So you can get some, um, so you can start trying it out. Uh, we're also trying to change from a community group into a W3C working group. Um, who here works for a company that's part of the W3C? A few of you. Um, who here knows who their AC rep is, their advisory committee rep? Cool. Um, if you don't, please find out who your advisory committee rep is and ask for them to vote for us. Um, <laughs> um, that's the cool thing about being on stage, I can do that. Um, yeah, because we, we really want to um, start a working group and it will allow us to finalize these APIs and get them out into more browsers and into the W3C standards. Thank you so much for listening. You've been, you've been amazing. Um, we have, follow our team at samsunginter.net, um, and um, we're on Twitter at, at samsunginternet. Um, and 
if you want to get involved, the, the community group and working group are really friendly, um, really nice. You come talk to me afterwards if you want to get involved, because, um, yeah, I'm trying to get this thing going well. Cool. Bye.